Well, would you stand with me as we read together from Luke 13, beginning this morning in verse 31. Luke 13, 31. And after, or at that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Father, this passage of Scripture seems a bit obscure in a way, but what a wonderful message it has. May I please ask that your Holy Spirit would make it clear to us this morning, crystal clear, and then would you help us to live in the good of this message? I pray this for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. If you haven't already, please turn with us to Luke 13. The first, uh, the first sin of all time, as best we know, is recorded for us in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, there it reads that Lucifer, who was one of the highest and most beautiful of God's creation, said this. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. This is the beginning of sin. And the essence of every sin since then has been the desire for control to be, in essence, one's own God. We're all born with that inclination. In our fallen human nature, submission, even to God, comes very hard. By the time you get into the you know, 18th century and the age of reason is upon humankind and the age of enlightenment, so-called, we were encouraged to enter into a man-centered view of things, a man-centered view of the world, an anti-God mindset that could be reflected in many, many quotes that we could bring to bear. One of those was a song by a guy named Algernon Swinburne. He wrote a song called Hymn to Man. Part of it went like this. It said, glory to man in the highest for man is the master of things. I don't know how many people would be that outgoing about saying it, but he is reflecting his time and our time. Modern geneticist H.J. Mueller says this. He says, we see the future of man as one of his own making. Politicians join in. Some of you may have heard JFK's quote, all man's problems were created by man and can be solved by man. I think Frank Sinatra probably summed it up best. I did it my way. That's our want, right? That's who we are outside of Christ. But the question is, is man really the master of his own fate? Can we really make our own future? That's, a, that's an important question, beloved. It's an eternally important question. How we answer it has eternal significance. The real question is, who is in charge here? Who is in charge? Secularism answers that question by saying that man is in charge. He's in charge of a chance-driven existence that basically yields a meaningless life because we came from nothing and we go to nothing. Jesus answers, God is in charge. God is in charge of a purposeful, God-glorifying universe, which, may, which while it may not look like, it is so God-glorifying at the moment, will eventually turn to, to the point where we see that everything that has ever happened has turned to the glory of God. Everything. 
This is the perspective of the Bible. This is the perspective of Jesus. And we have the option to either choose man's answer or to choose God's answer, but we must choose one or the other. The message of these few short verses that we just read is simply this. Who is in charge here? God is. God is in charge. Luke details that two ways here. He first of all shows us man's deluded attack on God, and then he'll show us God's divine authority. What a contrast. And I hope as you see this, you will consider this in light of your own life, whether you've come to Christ or not. This is an important thing to understand. So let's look first of all at man's deluded attack. Verse 31, at that very hour, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, get away from here for, Fer for Herod wants to kill you. Now this should strike you as peculiar if you've been with us at all, just from the standpoint of what? Pharisees coming to help Jesus, seeming to want to protect him. Can that really be true? Well, there are some good Pharisees in the Bible. Joseph of Arimathea, as we'll see later in this book. Nicodemus, who's introduced in John 3. These are men who were eventually godly men who were Pharisees. But for the most part, and certainly the way they've been presented in the book of Luke, the Pharisees were a self-justifying, deluded group of men. And there's no difference here, I don't believe. Notice the way this is introduced in verse 31, at that very hour. That refers us back to what we just studied. And if you'll recall, we've just been studying that sermon that Jesus gave where he talked about the wide way and the narrow way and the importance of coming to Christ through the narrow way. And you'll recall that he contrasted heaven and hell as the two possible alternatives to which everyone is headed in their eternal existence. And then he implied in that message that the Pharisees and their lot were headed toward the wrong destination. It was not a sermon that was calculated to win friends and influence people. And I don't believe it did here. These Pharisees are just as rotten as the rest of them. And I think they're coming with a threat because they want to move Jesus into Jerusalem. They already know what's happening in Jerusalem because we've already, from John ch chapter 7, verse 1, we know that by this time the Jews in Jerusalem are already plotting to kill him. So these guys want to get him to Jerusalem because they can't do much where he is here in, Palestine, in Galilee because the people are following him still in droves. They're interested in his message. They're interested in what he's doing. He's so popular, they dare not take him on. But if they could get him to Jerusalem, he would be in their territory. The leverage would suddenly swing to their side and the shift would be on. And so they want to get him there. This is a grand attempt to manipulate Jesus to move on. Who is in charge here? The Pharisees think they are. They think they are. But they're about to become, be brought up short and get a rude awakening from that delusion. And beloved, so is any person who arrogantly denies or ignores God. God is patient. If God were not patient, he would give us what we deserve when we deserve it, and the world would be unpopulated within the hour. But God is patient. But that doesn't mean that he has lost control. Believe me, beloved, when I tell you that, that there is no one among us, from the greatest to the least, who can move his little finger, except under the control of an almighty God, despite appearances, God is firmly in control of everything that goes on in his universe. Nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing is outside of his control. And no one is in charge except God. There's a, there's a verse in the Bible you may not have heard. It says this. It said, man, man throws the dice and God makes the dots come up. Perhaps if you haven't heard that, I should tell you it's a bit of a paraphrase of Proverbs 16, verse 33, which actually reads, the lot is cast in the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord, which means 
man throws the dice, but God makes the spots come up. We exercise our ability to choose. We go through life doing the things that we think are the decisions that we make every, every day, and yet behind the scenes, God is using every single decision that we make to eventually bring glory to himself. It may or may not be good for us, but it will certainly glorify God. God is in charge. Who is in charge here? God is. He always has been. He always will be. And everything, all things will work to his glory in the end. We are so, we, 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 leave, we leave the realm of reality, beloved, when we, when we think that somehow we're in charge and that God doesn't matter, that God can be ignored, that God can be denied, that God has somehow lost control. We're a bit like, we're, you know, we're a bit like the people in Great Britain. You know, in 1933, when Hitler came to power in Germany, you may, some of you probably read the history of this. He came to power in Germany and he began immediately to rebuild the German military power that was outlawed by the Treaty of Versailles that had ended World War I. Winston Churchill saw through this immediately. The politician in Great Britain who was kind of a middle-aged, forgotten politician by that time. He issued warnings against Hitler. Nobody listened. They labeled him an alarmist. And so the world stood by with a deaf ear and a blind eye as Hitler, first of all, took back the Rhineland that had been ceded at the end of the war. And then he annexed Austria. By that time, he had the world's attention. And so Prime Minister Chamberlain went to negotiate with him. And he came back saying, we've, we've, we've bought peace in our time. And all we had to do was give up a little bit of the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. Who cares about that? Peace in our time. Turned out to be peace for a few months until Hitler invaded Poland in September of 1939 and World War II broke out and the illusion that they can control the madman was over. Beloved, the illusion that man can control God will be over one of these days once and for all. It's not going to be long. It's not going to be long. The illusion that we have some control over God is craziness on our part. Just as the Pharisees discovered that Jesus was firmly in control, so the whole world will one day discover that Jesus is firmly in control. Man's deluded attack on the sovereignty of God will always come up short. There's no such thing as outdoing God. There isn't. Everything is under his control. So the deluded attack of man will fail. Now Jesus shows in three ways here the divine authority of God that causes that to happen. It caused it to happen. In this case, it will cause it to happen in the ultimate sense one of these days. So we look, move on to God's divine authority. How is it displayed here? Three ways. Three ways. First of all, his omniscience. His omniscience. And, and, and there's more than one sense in which you could say this, but I want to use it this morning in this sense. God's omniscience is such that he knows hearts and it matters what is in your heart. It matters what's in your heart. God knows hearts. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, go and tell that fox. He's speaking about Herod when he says that. It's an interesting phrase. It tells us a lot. It certainly illustrates to us or tells us how wicked this man Herod really was. Now, this is not Herod the Great who killed all the babies. This is his son, Herod Antipas, who was in charge of the section of Galilee at this point of time during Jesus' ministry. Jesus uses the term that is filled with utter contempt. Utter contempt. The term fox there is feminine. We might translate it, go tell that vixen or go tell that she-devil. It's utter contempt. You know, Jesus has some, some harsh words for the Pharisees in other places. If you read Matthew 23 sometime and other places, you'll find that he pronounces woes on them. But as we've seen before, these, are, these woes are pronounced as expressions of regret and as calls to repentance. You'd have to look long and hard to find anything 
in the ministry of Jesus so close to the absolute hopelessness of a situation as you see in this phrase, go tell that fox. A female fox, devious. The emphasis is upon the deviousness of this plot that has been had somewhere in the palace of Herod. But Jesus sees right through it. You may remember that Herod is the man who had John the Baptist killed. Remember that? But later on when Jesus' ministry started and the, and, the, and the word began to filter back to the palace about the miracles that were going on and about the influence that Jesus had with the populace, which was, which was as good as John the Baptist and maybe even more, Herod began to get really paranoid. Remember that? And he began to try and find out, who is this? Is this a prophet? What is this? And in his own demented mind, he began to think, ooh, what if this is John the Baptist raised from the dead? He was paranoid. And so he doesn't want to deal with another Jewish prophet. He just wants Jesus out of his territory. He wants to be rid of him. He doesn't want to have to deal with it. He's, he's afraid to do anything, I think, further. So I think what he did here is he called the Pharisees in because he knew they had a common enemy. They weren't necessarily friends, but they were when it came to opposition to Jesus. And I think he said something like this. He said, look, you guys, you guys want to get Jesus to Jerusalem. Get him out of this place where he's so popular. I want him out of my territory. But I don't really want to touch him because... Man, I'm scared of what happened with John the Baptist might happen here. And so let's do this. Why don't you go tell him that I'm out to kill him? That'll scare him off. And you can get him to Jerusalem and I can get him out of, out of my territory. And it's a win-win for both of us. That devious man had a plot and Jesus knew what it was. He saw right through it. He knew exactly what was going on. Fox here shows Herod's deviousness that Jesus is well aware of. The fact that he says to the Pharisees, go tell him, is very suggestive of the fact that he knew they had come from him. And see, so you guys know what you guys have done. You've hatched a big plot here. But don't fool yourselves that I don't see through it. I have a message for Herod. You can take it back to him. This is Jesus' unique ability, beloved, to see into man's hearts. What man can do that? Who can do that? Why do we think as created beings that somehow we can match up against the omniscience of God? And yet we see phrases like that all the time from some people in our culture. I love the fact that some who, in some cases, aren't even believers can realize the folly of this. The story is told of Albert Einstein one time, arguably one of the most brilliant men of the 20th century who gazed up at the sky as he was out sailing on his sailboat one day. He said, we know, we know nothing about it at all. Someone asked him, well, do you think we'll ever be able to probe the secret? Einstein replied this way. He said, possibly we shall know a little more than we do now, but the real nature of things we shall never know. Never. That's brilliant honesty, I think. That's a man who's acknowledging that there is something more than we. You know, as the highest of God's creation, man has great abilities. There's no question about that. But he also has severe limitations. If you think about this carefully, you'll realize that every time we get a new answer from science, discover some new thing, one new thing leads to a whole bucket full of new questions. Have you ever noticed that? We don't get to the bottom of things. We just get one more step down a path that leads us into a whole new realm of ignorance. Things that we don't understand. Things that we cannot get to the bottom of. I could give you illustration of illustration about that, but, but, but that's the severe limitation that attaches to this. Think about it in one sense. How about in, in our ability to understand what's in man's heart? Do you realize the area of psychology is probably the least defined, the most enigmatic of all of the sciences that exist? Now, we, we go to psychology and think, this guy's going to straighten me out. Guess again. Did you know that there are at least 
250 different systems of psychology, that is, ways of explaining how and why we act the way we do, at least 250 of those in the United States. You can double that when you go worldwide. Don't kid yourself that a psychiatrist or a psychologist understands who you are inside. But I can tell you who does. God does. God knows who you are. God sees into your heart. God knows what we are inside. God sees into a heart and there's no problem. It's not a contest, beloved. It's not intended to be. When we think we can pit our knowledge against God's, we only fool ourselves. We're like the, we're like the little boy who was helping his dad, you know, put out cookies and milk for Santa Claus. Dropped a cookie. The little boy dropped a cookie on the floor, you know. Dad picked it up and he brushed it off and he said, Hey, we'll just put it back on the plate. Santa will never know. <laughs> Little boy looked at him and he said, Dad, are you kidding? Are you telling me he knows whether I've been good or bad, but he doesn't know the cookie dropped on the floor? <laughs> Who are you kidding? God is omniscient, beloved. There's nothing that escapes his notice. He knows everything. He knows your heart. Who's in charge here? An omniscient God is in charge. An omniscient God is in charge. Here's another way Jesus displays the greatness of God's divine authority. He displays it in the sense of God's omnipotence. He displays God's omnipotence here, which means that God fulfills missions. God accomplishes what he sets out to do. This is absolutely beautiful in this passage. I love this. It's a, Jesus demonstrates here a magnificent disregard for the human delusionary attempts to control his destiny. It isn't even a question mark that this is a possibility. Look what he says in verse 32. He said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day, I finish my course. What is Jesus saying here? What he's saying is, I operate on my schedule, not on yours. You think I ought to run from Herod? You think I ought to get out of here because he's going to kill me? Listen, let me tell you how this is going down. I have things that I have to do here today, and I'm going to do them. I have things I have to do here tomorrow, and I'm going to do them. On the third day, I'll finish my mission here, and then I'll move on. Then and only then. I'm not operating on Herod's schedule. I'm not operating on your schedule. I'm operating on the schedule of my Heavenly Father. And he completes his missions. He doesn't run. He doesn't quit. He doesn't go somewhere. He completes what he starts. You know, the reference to a third day here is probably figurative. We don't really know how long Jesus continued in this particular place. But what he's saying is, I'll be here as long as it takes to finish my mission. No more, no less. All the king's horses and all the king's men and all the forces of hell can't make it one second more or one second less than I need to complete the mission the Father has given me. My schedule is dictated by the Father, not by you, not by anybody else. And that's exactly what happened because God is omnipotent and man is not. Aren't you glad you serve a God like that? <laughs> Aren't we fortunate we serve a God like that? When he sets out to do something as hard as it may be, God completes it. Beloved, the truth is, I know a lot of people don't like this, but the truth is that God has every person, every person on an invisible but short leash from the lowest to the highest, from the greatest to the most insignificant. Turn, to me, turn with me to Psalm, this second chapter of Psalm. Psalm chapter 2. Look at this. I remember the first time I ever 
read this passage of Scripture and I thought, wow, what a, what a strong, impressive statement here. Psalm chapter 2. God says this, he said, why, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let's burst their bonds apart and cast their cords from us. What's God doing while that's all going on? He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. That's what God thinks of those who think that they can control him. Think that somehow they're in charge, whether it's of their destiny or somebody else's destiny. Or it's mighty as men are nothing but pawns in the hands of God. Do you remember how Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian, when the, the, the greatest man on earth in, in his time, he had just inherited the throne from his father. And Babylon had already grown into a, into a significant power by that time, but in order to solidify it, he went down to Egypt. And in the Battle of Carchemish, in 609 BC, he took over Egypt. And he basically had, mostly under contr his control, the, the known world at that point in time. And as he's basically going home from Egypt to back to Babylon in the east, he's going through Palestine. And he says, well, while I'm here, I might as well make them vassals as well. And so he does. He takes them captive. And he gets back home and Nebuchadnezzar, as far as he is concerned, is in charge of his own destiny. Nebuchadnezzar, because of the power that resided in his own hands and in his own might, in his own way, was able to take over the world. But notice what, here's what God said. Here's God's perspective that's given to us in Jeremiah. The, uh, he was a prophet. He was a Palestinian prophet who was operating at that very time. And here's what God said through Jeremiah in chapter 27, verse 6. He said, now I, God, have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. From God's perspective, Babylon, the Babylonian king, the great Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, was nothing but a servant of God. That's all he was. God calls him the same thing in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 9, and in chapter 43, verse 10, just to make sure we get the point. Nebuchadnezzar belonged to him. And if you want to see how God called the mighty Nebuchadnezzar to faith in himself, read Daniel chapters 1 through 4. And you will see how God worked in that man's life. But Nebuchadnezzar wasn't in charge. God was in charge. Who was in charge when God needed somebody to get the baby Jesus and his mother and father all the way from Nazareth down to Bethlehem so that he could be born, so that the Messiah could be born in the right place that had been prophesied in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, 800 years before. I need him in Bethlehem. Who did he choose to get him down there? Caesar Augustus. The mightiest man in the world was nothing but the servant of God. The greatest thing that he ever did in his whole rulership was to issue an edict that everybody should be taxed so that the Messiah was born where he was supposed to be born. They're just servants in the hands of God, beloved. Seventy years after Israel went into captivity in Babylon, they were released as, as God had prophesied in, this, in Jeremiah. Seventy years, you're going to be in captivity and then you'll be released. In Isaiah... Chapter 44, verse 28, and chapter 45, verse 1, you'll find that God prophesied by name who was going to release them, somebody named Cyrus. Before he was ever born, 150 years before he did the act, God prophesied Cyrus is going to do this. And the guy who is known to history as Cyrus the Great did exactly that. He came to power by taking over the Babylonian kingdom, and then he turned around and almost immediately released the Israelites to go back from their captivity. Listen, who's in charge here? An omnipotent God is in charge. Nothing escapes his notice. A third way Jesus demonstrates the authority of God is through God's sovereignty. And here we need to learn that he keeps promises. He keeps promises. God is sovereign. He doesn't make promises that he can't keep. You make promises sometimes and you can't keep them, right? 
had all good intention when you made the promise, but now suddenly you can't keep it. Never happens to God. Never. Look at verse 33. Jesus says, nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Now, you know, that kind of causes us to ask, well, what gives here? If God is omnipotent, and if Jesus isn't going anywhere until he's good and ready, which means he can do whatever he wants to, why is he suddenly talking about perishing? Why would someone who has that much power be thinking about dying? Wouldn't escape from dying, if Herod is really intending to kill him, wouldn't escaping Herod, if he has that much power, wouldn't that be the thing to do? Wouldn't that be the ultimate in-your-face Herod to escape his control? Of course, human perspective, it would. But see, Jesus' ultimate mission, <laughs> Jesus' ultimate mission wasn't to defeat Herod. That's not why he was here. Jesus' ultimate mission was what? To redeem a fallen race by paying the penalty for sin so that anyone who would ever believe and trust in him could have forgiveness of sin and cleansing and could be right with God. That was his mission. He was going to have to die in order to do that, but even the death was not going to be at Herod's hands. The death that Jesus died brought guilt on the Jews and it brought guilt on the Romans, but he was not ultimately sent to his death by them. God could have stopped that cold at any point when he decided to. You remember Pilate, when Pilate was, had Jesus and was interrogating him after he had been brought to him, after he was arrested, and, and, and they had a, a nice conversation about certain things, but then certain things Jesus decided not to talk and he wouldn't answer. And Pilate, if you were to turn to John 19, we won't turn there, but let me just read it for you. Pilate was incensed. According to John 19, verse 10, Pilate said, you will not speak to me? Sometimes it helps to get the emphasis on the right word in Scripture, right? You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Pilate thought Pilate was in charge. Pilate thought wrong. God was in charge. Jesus says in Matthew 26, verse 53, he said, do you not think I can appeal to my father and he will send at once, he will send me more than 12 legions of angels? It's so, okay, Jesus, if you can do that, why don't you call the angels? Why don't you escape this death that you're about to go to? Well, the next verse in Matthew 26, verse 54 answers. Jesus says, but how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? If I called all those angels, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Why is it so important that the scriptures be fulfilled? Because that demonstrates that God keeps his promises. God is sovereign. He keeps promises. And beginning in Genesis 3.15 and throughout the whole Old Testament, what's he been promising? Deliverance from sin. He's been promising there's going to be someone who will pay the price for your sins. There's going to be the Lamb of God who will come. There will be all of these little sacrifices that you've seen. There will be an ultimate and final sacrifice that will actually be able to make payment for sin. He's been promising a prophet and a priest and a king and a sacrifice. And it all is residing in the person of Jesus Christ. So it has to happen. Or God wouldn't be keeping promises, but God is sovereign. God keeps promises. Who's in charge here? God is. That's why back in Luke chapter 13, in verse 33, Jesus says this. Jesus says, nevertheless, I must go. The word that's used there is the Greek word day, D-E-A. We've seen it before. It's a word of, it, it means it, this is something that absolutely must happen. It is positively necessary that this happen. What must happen? I must die. Why must you die? Because it's been prophesied. Why must it be in Jerusalem? 
because it's been prophesied to be in Jerusalem. It's been prophesied in Daniel 9 to be in Jerusalem. It's been prophesied symbolically in the almost sacrifice of Isaac by his father Abraham, which happened on the Mount of Moriah, which is exactly the same mountain where the temple is residing at the time Jesus is saying this. It has to happen because it's been prophesied. God promised and God keeps his promises. It has to happen. It cannot be any other way. Our salvation couldn't be any other way and God's word would not be kept any other way. I mean, can't you, just, can't you see God's greatness in all of this? It just, it just filters through everywhere. Every piece of the puzzle is fitting together in the person of Christ. Jesus will die, but he will die on his own terms. He will not die on Herod's terms. He will not die on the terms of the Jewish people. Jews, Romans, Pharisees, Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the religious rulers of Jesus' time, Jesus used their freely determined choices to carry out the plan of God that had been in place since before the foundation of the world. How does God do that? I don't know. I'd be God if I knew that. That's what's so great about this. God is greater than we are. And God is sovereign and God keeps promises. Remember what he said in Isaiah 53, verse 10, the John 3, 16 in the Old Testament. We looked at it at Christmas last year. Isaiah 53, verse 10, he says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, the Messiah, Jesus. He has put him to grief, not the Jews, Romans, Sanhedrin, Pharisees, Sadducees, and all the rest of them. God the Father. He has crushed him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, for he, Jesus the Son, shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Who sent Jesus to the cross? The Father did, knowing full well that he was going to raise him again so that he could see his offspring. We, that is, we who believe. And the Son went willingly. You remember what it says in John 10 verse 17, when it says, for this reason the Father loves me, Jesus said, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Even, here's the point. Even at the cross, even at the most defeated, humiliating from a human standpoint, the worst possible day of Jesus' life, humanly speaking, the time when he looked absolutely the weakest, guess what? God was fully in charge doing exactly what had to be done because he had promised that it would be done in order to accomplish our salvation. God keeps promises. So let me ask you, if for some reason you happen to be here this morning and you've never accepted him into your life, why not allow him to keep one more promise, which is his promise to save to the uttermost those who will come in faith to him? Why not today? Who's in charge here? God is, no one else. John MacArthur had a great story. Many of you know John. John's pastor in Southern California had a tremendous influence on our generation through his CDs and messages that have been worldwide and the ministry of his own church where he's been for 40 years. He was in great health a few years ago when he had to have surgery to correct a knee problem that was, you know, something that was left over from an old football injury. And so he went into the hospital to have that done, but without warning, blood clots formed and went to his lungs and they created a life-threatening situation. They didn't really know what to do. John says this, he said, I was lying there wondering what the purpose, purposes of God in this were, I was thinking about going to heaven. It was looking pretty good. In fact, when I recovered, I was just a, a little bit mildly disappointed. <laughs> like to think I could think that way. But what happened was a friend heard about this and he, he knew a doctor who specialized in whatever the problem was and he sent the doctor to John and that doctor knew immediately exactly what to do and so he did. He was a godless man but he warmed to John as they began to spend time together in these treatments or whatever was going on. 
And so John came essentially back to life and was doing well. But, then, but he told, he warned him when he was getting out of the hospital, he said this, he said, now you can't preach for three months. He said, because if you stand up, you'll have more blood, blood, blood clot problems. He said, that is unless you preach 10 minutes. If you know MacArthur, you'll love this. He said, I, I can't preach 10 minutes. I can't do that. I can't clear my throat in 10 minutes. Which is true. The doc said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm curious to hear you preach. I want to hear you preach. Let me know the first Sunday you're going to be back preaching because I want to come and, and hear you preach. He said, I haven't been in church since I was 16. He was 57 at the time. He said, I'll come and hear you preach. Well, long story short, John let the doc know when he was, when he was going to preach. He said, I, I, I didn't know that he, whether he'd be there or not. He said, I was starting a new, a new series in Luke. <laughs> Don't despair. It took him 13 years to get through Luke. We're not going to be that way. I might as well admit, but it took him that long. He said, I was starting a new series in Luke. And then he says this, he said, there he was on the third row, sitting there, having not been in church since he was 16 years of age. And I announced that I was beginning a series on Luke, and my first sermon was Luke, the beloved physician. You think God's not in charge? God's in charge, beloved. It's never been anything else but an absolute charge. That was 10 years ago. Roughly, the doctor has, according to the sermon where I took this from, the doctor's never missed a Sunday. Within a month, he had given his life to Christ. They'd become great friends. But MacArthur said this, he said, I suggested to the Lord there might have been a plan B to evangelize the guy. It's a little hairy approach. <laughs> Sometimes we think that, right? But that's just one illustration of the providences of God that unfold, the endearing providences of God that unfold in your life. Think you're in charge? Not even close. You get to make decisions, but you're not in charge. God's in charge. And see, whether you're here this morning hearing this sermon out of your own free choice or whether you're hearing out of a CD or watching it on a, on a video online or whatever, God put you where you are. God arranged for you to hear this. God wants you to know that he's in charge. God gave you this one more opportunity to trust your life to him if you've never done that. God did that. And if you do know him, if he is your Lord and Savior, glory in the fact, beloved, that we serve a God who's in charge. The end is not in question. Be determined. You're on the winning side with him. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you're in charge. Thank you that there isn't any question about that. And we pray that, Lord, I just pray for anyone here that is hearing this, that somehow you've brought this, brought them into contact with this simple message. I, I just pray it's been clear, but... Father, I pray that you, you will do the one who will do the clarifying where it's been unclear. To make, to make certain that whoever it is that's hearing has the opportunity to know that you died for their sins on purpose. That you were resurrected again to give them eternal life. And that you've done it all. There's nothing left for them to do. There's no work to do. There's no ritual to go through. There's nothing except to just throw themselves on your mercy. I pray that you would touch those hearts that need to be touched. And Lord, for those of us who know you, oh, increase our faith, Father, to realize we have, a, we have such a wonderful task to make your word known to others, to share the love of Jesus with others in whatever way we can. We may or may not be glib, but we have opportunity to give, to send missionaries, to talk to our neighbors, to invite them to events, to do whatever we can to share with them the love of Christ. Would you please give us tremendous compassion based on the fact that you're in charge. The results are yours. The faithfulness, that's ours. Help us to be faithful. Pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.